So let's suppose that you have some animal, uh, maybe like this giraffe, and you'd want to animate a walk cycle for it. Well, if it were a human, you could just go out and get motion capture data. That's possible for an animal like this, but hard. But nevertheless, uh, perhaps instead you could go out to YouTube or your favorite video sharing site, find a video of what you want, and then use that as a reference for your animation. So that's all well and good, but it's not always going to work because you can't always get that sort of video in the first place. Uh, so this project that I'll be uh, presenting an overview of here uh, is designed to completely automatically synthesize realistic walking gates uh, for animals like this for which you don't have or can't get video data. So if I have an animal and I know what it's shaped like, like say this velociraptor here, how might I go about deciding on a motion for it? Well, when I was a kid, I had a toy like this, and since it was made of plastic, it had a very crude motion as it terrorized the other toys. But in my mind's eye, it was quite different. And it walked something more like this. So it's worth asking, why did I picture this sort of motion for it? Well, probably I'd seen videos of various birds walking. And because they had a similar shape, I was able to make an educated guess and extrapolate the motions of these animals that I had seen onto the motion of this creature that I'd never seen. And at a very high level, this is essentially what our technique does. Uh, and that animation you see at the bottom there was completely automatically generated by it. So this is a kind of locomotion synthesis approach. And locomotion synthesis approaches have been looked at in computer graphics many times. There's a spectrum of techniques ranging from artist-driven to semi-automatic to completely automatic like ours. But for this particular application I've described, there's a few things we'd like uh, our method to do well they are a bit of a problem for pre-existing approaches. Uh, in particular, we'd like it to apply to a wide range of different creatures. Uh, so for example, bipeds and quadrupeds, or animals with very different sizes, without needing to manually tune any parameters when you want to synthesize an animation. We'd also like the generated animations to be realistic looking. Uh, so I may as well pick on some of my own previous research here and show an example of a previous technique which does apply to a wide range of different creatures, but for which you can see the generated motions have some pretty serious artifacts. So we're going to aim to do a bit better. And we're going to do this by combining two different ideas. The first of these is sparse data interpolation. This is essentially the process of how we look at animals for which we do know how they move in the real world, and then extrapolate their motions onto a new animal where we don't have video data for it. And we're going to combine this with an approach known as inverse optimization. And it turns out that this is going to be very useful in having the sparse data interpolation actually work well. So I'll start off by describing how we get some of the data that our technique uses underneath, uh, then go into the basics of gate synthesis, and after that, via an intermediate step, go into the synthesis of gates for animals that we don't have any video data for. So I'll start off uh, with how we capture some data uh, that our method uses underneath in order to uh, generate these animations. And this is essentially going to be the construction of what we call a motion database. And our motion database consists of six bipeds and 12 quadrupeds. And for each of these creatures, we go out online and find a video of it walking. And we're gonna focus in particular on sagittal plane, that is side-on walks, because videos like this are both the easiest to find and the easiest to process. So here's an example of what that looks like for the gazelle. For each animal like this, we do a bit of semi-manual processing and fit a physically valid 3D gate cycle to the motion in the video. And we're gonna sort of consider this the ground truth motion for how the animal walks in the real world. So for each animal, we know what it's shaped like and we know how it moves in the real world. And since we have this form and motion pairing for a bunch of different animals, We'll compile them all together into the motion database so that then, given a new creature, we can look in the motion database for animals that have a similar shape and then make an educated guess as to the motion of this new animal by looking at the motions of those sort of animals in the motion database that had a similar shape to the input animal. So before I can describe how that's done, uh, I need to go just over the, some of the basics of gate synthesis, uh, not really caring yet if the synthesized gates are realistic or not. So if you have an animal like this, uh, being the sort of stick figure abstracted version of the gazelle, there's a few different approaches you can use to synthesize an animation for it. We use one called space-time constraints because it turns out it's pretty easy to apply to a wide range of different creatures. And this sort of approach starts by defining a function. 
This function takes as input a motion, and it computes something roughly analogous to the amount of effort the animal would have to exert in order to perform that motion. And for the remainder of the talk, I'm just going to denote a motion with the variable x. So of course different motions require different amounts of effort for the animal to perform. So to, to actually synthesize a motion, we just take the additional biomechanical assumption that, well, the animal's probably not going to want to waste too much energy while walking around, and we search for the particular motion which allows it to walk using a minimal amount of effort, and that leads to an optimization problem, like I've sort of diagrammatically depicted here. And you'll notice at the bottom I've put the word effort uh, to remind you that this optimization is minimizing the effort involved in the motion. And of course this is also subject to the constraint that the motion must obey the laws of physics and the animal can't just use telekinesis and hover along or something, uh, which it will do in the animation if you don't include this. Uh, but I'm going to leave this constraint implicit, although ever present, for the remainder of the talk. So now, given what an animal is shaped like, we search for the particular way that it can walk using a minimal amount of effort, and that gives us uh, a walking animation for the creature. And it turns out this works relatively well in practice. Uh, but when you actually dig into the details, it turns out that the details of this, how you calculate this effort term here, or how you calculate this effort, uh, they matter, and they're not easy to get right. Uh, so for example, I tried to do this by hand, and I got something like the animation you see on the right there, where the gazelle's back legs are kind of wonky. So our approach is essentially going to be to use the motion database to learn a better idea of what this effort should be. So uh, as a stepping stone to doing this for animals that we don't have any video data for, I'm going to focus first on how to do this for animals where you do have video data for them, uh, for how they move in the real world, that is. But it's going to use this video data in a kind of indirect way, which is, turns out is going to be useful later in the talk when we want to apply it to new creatures. To see how to do this, let's go back to our basic motion synthesis optimization there. And we're going to modify it by augmenting it with another vector of parameters. So now this function f that computes the effort, remember, is a function not only of the motion, but of this vector of what I'm going to call inverse parameters. And these essentially let us change how this effort is computed. The idea then, given that we know how the animal moves in the real world, is going to be to pick values of these inverse parameters, thereby picking a particular way of calculating this effort, so that the motion that requires a minimal amount of that particular notion of effort matches the real motion as best as possible. So in our case, uh, this vector of inverse parameters that I've just denoted as theta in the previous slide uh, is a combination of a bunch of different terms. And you can essentially think of these as approximating the effect of biomechanical unknowns, either uh, unknowns about the animal itself or about the interaction between the animal and its environment. And so all of these terms are kind of squished together in this vector theta. So now it remains uh, to actually choose what these uh, biomechanical unknowns should be so you get a realistic gate, basically to figure out what the value of theta should be. To do this, let's just note that this optimization here, this motion synthesis optimization, really just takes as input an animal, produces as output a motion for it, and it does this based on the values of these inverse parameters. So I can just compactly denote that like so. Then, given that we know how an animal moves in the real world, we'd like to choose these inverse parameters so that the synthesized motion closely matches the real motion. And we'll measure how well they match by defining a distance function. This function takes as input two motions and computes a value saying how well they match. So a value of zero means they match perfectly, while higher values mean they match less well. And again, I'll compactly denote that like so. So to actually choose the values of the inference parameters, we solve another optimization problem, where we take as input the real world motion for the animal, and we search for the, values of, for the values of these inverse parameters, such that the synthesized motion matches the real motion as best as possible. And to sort of make this a little more explicit and expand everything back out, you'll notice this is a kind of nested optimization now. Then, once we've found these inverse parameters, we can solve a motion synthesis problem like we had before to get a gate for the animal. And this kind of approach is what is known as inverse optimization. 
and inverse optimization approaches have been used a couple times in computer graphics animation before. But it turns out there's an issue when you try to do, use this technique for animals that you don't have any video data for. So let's look at a way you might try to do that. So we have all these different uh, animals in the motion database, and we know both the form and the real world motion for each of them. So for each of these animals, we could solve one of these inverse optimization problems and find a vector of inverse parameters so that that particular animal's uh, synthesized motion closely matches its real motion. Then, given a new creature that isn't in the motion database, we can compare its shape to each of the animals that are in the motion database and interpolate between these inverse parameters based on how well these shapes match, essentially taking more of a contribution from animals which uh, have a shape which closer matches your input animal. Then we could use these inverse parameters to solve for a motion. But it turns out there's a problem here, and to illustrate this I'm going to draw a graph. Now on the x-axis is going to be the masses of the different quadrupeds in the motion database, and on the y-axis I'm going to pick a representative inverse parameter. In this case it'll be the one essentially approximating how strong the animal's elbow joint is. And if I plot that, I get something like so. So now if I have a new animal, say that this is its mass, uh, and I should mention, uh, in the actual work we take into account more than the mass. We also take out the animal shapes, it just happens to be easy to plot it with just mass here. So we'll just pretend it's just mass for the moment, but keep in mind it's more than that in reality. Anyway, let's say we have an animal uh, with this mass. What should the value of this inverse parameter be? This, or this, or this? It's impossible to say because there's no coherent pattern here. And in retrospect, Maybe this isn't too surprising, because after all, for each animal, these inverse parameters were found independently of all the other animals. So to fix this, we're going to introduce a new algorithm that we call joint inverse optimization. And the word joint here does not refer to the joints in the animal skeleton, but rather to the fact that we're going to jointly solve an inverse optimization problem across all the animals at once. So this, uh, and this is what's going to combine these notions I mentioned earlier of sparse data interpolation with inverse optimization. So to see how this is done, let's go back to our set of independent inverse optimizations that we had before. And I'm going to kind of rearrange this a little bit, uh, like so. So now instead of a bunch of independent optimizations, we have a single optimization, where we take as input all the animals in the motion database, and all at once solve for all of the inverse parameters for all of the animals. Now, as I've written things here, this is really just a reformulation of what you had, what we had before, and it's not going to give you any different results, because there's nothing in this objective function I've written that relates one animal to another. It really is just a mathematical reformulation of what we had before. Uh, so to fix this, we can just add it. Uh, add something relating the animals to each other. Uh, and this is now a joint inverse optimization problem where we take as input all the animals at once, and we solve this uh, problem for all the inverse parameters for all of the animals, and we solve this trying to have a combination of two things happen. Firstly, for each animal taken in isolation, we would like its synthesized motion to closely match its real motion. But in addition to this, for all the animals taken together, we would like the set of inverse parameters for all of the animals to be well suited for extrapolating onto new creatures. Uh, in our case, this is going to end up being a kind of smoothness constraint, essentially saying that animals with similar shapes should have similar values for these inverse parameters. So that brings us from this case uh, with independent inverse optimization to this case with joint inverse optimization. So now if I have this creature, it's much less ambiguous what the value of this inverse parameter should be, and indeed uh, you get better results for it. And uh, from then on, the algorithm proceeds about as before. Given a new animal, you interpolate between these inverse parameters based on the similarity between this input animal shape and the shapes of each of the animals in the motion database. But now, critically, because we use joint inverse optimization, this interpolation actually makes sense. Then you can use the set of interpolated inverse parameters to solve for a motion for your animal. So let's see how the results of this look like. So here, on the upper left, I'm showing the ground truth motion for the gazelle. This is as we directly fit to video footage. And in each of the other three quadrants, I'm going to show the result of a leave one out test. 
where I've excluded the gazelle from the motion database and then resynthesized a motion for it based only on the other remaining animals. So in the upper right, we have our approach using joint inverse optimization. And then for comparison, on the lower right, uh, what happens if you use a set of independent inverse optimizations? And also, a technique where you say, ah, forget all this business about inverse parameters, I'm just going to try to interpolate between the motions directly. In this latter case, you'll see some pretty serious artifacts. For example, the gazelle won't lift its back leg off the ground. The two approaches based on inverse optimization perform a bit better, which I think is perhaps indicative that these inverse parameters are better suited to interpolation than the motions themselves are. But nevertheless, uh, with a set of independent inverse optimizations, you'll see some artifacts. For example, the gazelle's front leg won't extend properly during its contact phase, whereas using joint inverse optimization, you'll get a better match to the real motion. I'll show the same sort of thing on a biped, in this case the ostrich. So as before, uh, with the independent inverse optimization, you'll see that the ostrich doesn't bend its leg properly during the swing phase, whereas with joint inverse optimization, it's again a much better match for how the animal actually moves in the real world. But of course, one of the nice things about this approach, uh, in fact, kind of the whole reason we did it, is that you can synthesize motions for creatures that you don't have video data for in the first place. And so here's an example of that. Uh, we have several uh, extinct land mammals and uh, or mammals and land birds, uh, including a little guy that's off screen at the moment. And these are the motions synthesized by our approach. So each of these was just generated by telling our system what the animal is shaped like, uh, and then it would automatically spit out this walking animation for it. And these walking animations have some nice properties. So to illustrate this, uh, I've constructed three dinosaurs here uh, so that they have essentially the same shape but different sizes. And you get these motions for them. Where sort of as you would expect in the real world, uh, the an the, even though they have the same shape, their walking motions differ because they have different sizes. So the large dinosaur does not walk like the small dinosaur, uh, which is kind of a property you'd like an animation method like this to have. Uh, let's take a look at this in the case of some quadrupeds as well. So now, for example, if you compare the motion of the Triceratops in the back to the Protoceratops in the front, you'll see these motions are very different, and in a way which makes visual qualitative sense, given the fact that the Triceratops is a much larger and much more massive creature. So let's take a look at that Triceratops motion again, because I think it represents both an interesting success and failure of our algorithm. Uh, I consider it a success in that, at least when I first saw this, I thought it looked pretty decent. But I showed this to the artist, uh, Scott Hartman, who did some of those skeletal drawings that you've seen in the talk, and he mentioned that we actually know enough about a Triceratops to say that it couldn't straighten its back leg like this. Uh, but of course, this uh, sort of fact about a Triceratops is not something that this joint inverse optimization algorithm is aware of. And essentially what it did is it looked at how a elephant moves its legs and extrapolated this onto a Triceratops. Uh, it turns out that this wasn't sort of appropriate, given the slightly different morphology of the Triceratops. But a nice thing about having a physics-based optimization like we've got is that you can just really, really easily, in one line of code, add this constraint, essentially specifying a maximum angle of extension for the Triceratops' back leg. And this is what you get now, which is hopefully a little better match uh, for the hypothetical reality of how it moved in this case. So there's a few directions this could be pushed in the future. Uh, I think maybe one of the biggest ones is a more faithful biomechanical model. So for example, we don't do a proper modeling of muscles or tendons or ligaments in these creatures. Uh, but actually doing this would probably help in the animations and to the extrapolation onto creatures really unlike anything that's alive, like sauropods or fictional creatures or something. In addition, it'd be good to go beyond just walking gates into the synthesis of a more rich variety of motions or even motion controllers. So if you've listened this far, thank you. I'd like to point out that there is a project webpage. It's linked either in both in the uh, YouTube info section down there, or you can just Google for it by searching for the name of the paper. Uh, and one of the things you'll find there is a technical paper going into the stuff I talked about, but in a lot more depth. So if you really want to dig into the meat of how this is done, uh, that's probably the best place to do it. Thanks.